Pon Law Thropathy. I hope you all enjoyed the session very much. So let's move on to the next session. Uh, I'm Dr. Pratyusha. I'm a consultant rheumatologist and I work in Guntur, Andhra Pradesh. So I think this is one of the very interesting sessions because as clinicians, we regularly encounter the question, what kind of diet should I be taking? What kind of lifestyle modifications should I adapt once I'm uh, diagnosed with a rheumatic disease? So to talk on this wonderful topic, our beautiful speaker, and to chair the session, I would like to call upon Dr. Beamlesh Dar Pandey. He's a senior consultant rheumatologist from Portis Hospital, Noida. And Dr. Neha Agawal, consultant rheumatologist from Narayana Super Specialty Hospital, Guru. I'll hand over the mic to you. A never ending topic the most controversial the least we can satisfy is you know you, you put any of those patient reported outcome in, at least in our context Indian context food and its relevance is the first and the last thing that is discussed or is wished by a patient to be discussed so let us uh, set the ball rolling and we should ask Dr. Pratyusha Dr. Pratyusha Rajvardhan no uh, we have a change yeah? It's not Pratyusha, it's a Sunita. Okay. So we call Dr. Sunita. She's going to speak on food, spices in rheumatic diseases, evidence versus myth. Now this is a very important lesson that we will be gaining today. Dr. Sunita, she's at Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So coming to my topic that is food and spices in rheumatic diseases, evidence versus myths. So uh, this is uh, like in every our outpatient setting when we uh, when we diagnose a patient with a rheumatic disease, uh, whether it is arthritis or any kind of autoimmune disease, there are certain questions that are definitely asked by most of the patients like what foods to eat, are there are any special diets uh, for uh, this particular disease or are there any foods to avoid and uh, whether I have to be on any food supplements or not. So we'll be uh, going, in the next few slides I'll be going through like whether we have any evidence on these particular uh, things. So uh, when we see the myths uh, that the patient asks, like there are like several, n number of myths around the globe and also within the country if we see in India, there are different kinds of myths in the north and different kinds of the myth in the south. So this is uh, one study uh, which was published in Arthritis Care Research in 2017. This was done in a center in US where they have uh, asked the uh, patients, uh, like around 300 patients, they have given around 20 variety of foods and they were asked uh, whether uh, whether these foods affect their RA symptoms. So they, they have seen like 24% of the subjects reported symptoms. And then the next question asked was, like uh, whether uh, they had any improvement after eating these foods or whether they reported any worsening of the symptoms. So they, uh, they were like the 15% they reported improvement mm -hmm. with certain foods and 19% reported worsening with foods. So the foods which commonly associated with worsening include soda with sugars, desserts and beer, red meat, eggplant in the descending order. And the foods which are associated with improvement included berries, fish, strawberries and spinach. So when we come to the India, this was study done from one of the uh, doctors from Hyderabad, Dr. A. N. Roy. He actually had studied uh, to see whether there are any diet related disease flares in patients with rheumatic diseases. So they have surveyed 2000 and odd patients and they have reported around 20 patient, around 10 percent of the patients have reported disease aggravation after taking certain foods. Among them, in the, in the meat category, they have seen chicken was associated with most uh, aggravation and in the vegetables, uh, there are certain foods which they have seen uh, flares uh, like potato, tamarind and the lemon, the citrus fruits and in the fruits, few reported uh, aggravation with the banana, orange and apple. However, uh, this uh, aggravation did not result in any discontinuation of uh, these foods. This was the observation from the studies. So um, the next few slides I'll going to discuss about any evidence is there like uh, whenever uh, we uh, come across a patient and the patient is asking us like whether uh, we have to eat these foods or not. So let's see the evidence. So I'll be discussing uh, uh, initially on the diets. 
so the diet which was studied most was a mediterranean diet mediterranean diet is basically uh, loaded with lot of uh, fruits uh, vegetables and uh, whole grains bre- bread and legumes and they have uh, less uh, content of the fats and the fat which is mainly included here is the olive oil and they have very very low meat so basically it is loaded with lot of mono unsaturated fatty acids tocopherol antioxidants and polyphenols so when we look at the evidence whether this mediterranean diet has really a role in rheumatoid arthritis so there was a systemic review which states that it has some beneficial effects in reducing the pain and improving the physical function in patients with arthritis and when they have uh, especially looked for which particular item is actually associated with this uh, improvement they have seen that mono unsaturated fatty acids is an independent predictor of remission in rheumatoid arthritis patients in other uh, diseases like lupus it, and uh, lupus and osteoarthritis it was studied but it had not shown any significant role and um, let's talk about the prevention whether uh, like taking mediterranean diet regularly can it prevent the development of arthritis so it was studied in a nurses health study 1 and 2 so the huge number of patients who were on mediterranean diet were followed and they they found there was no significant association even after adherence to the mediterranean diet so coming to the next diet that is gluten diet there are no good studies on this particular diet but uh, the scientific evidence is like uh, like look at that gluten when take when taken it has reduced the antibodies like antibodies to beta lactoglobulin and gliadin and it had shown to improve the disease activity in patients with rheumatoid arthritis in one particular study and there and it also has some atheroprotective and anti inflammatory properties so there was uh, some association with rheumatoid arthritis and celiac disease so that was the main reason for studying this diet however we don't have any evidence to say that uh, to remove the gluten from the diet and it will improve the symptoms of arthritis or any kind of rheumatic diseases coming to the vegan diets so this was studied in very few patients there were two studies one study was done uh, in pa- in 24 patients with rheumatoid arthritis where they have given very low fat vegan diet and they have uh, improved uh, they have shown that there was significant reduction in the sim- symptoms uh, and uh, except the duration of the morning stiffness was not changed and there was no change in the inflammatory markers as well and the other study where they have uh, uh, i mean they have uh, asked the patient to be on fast and they ha- then they have introduced the vegan diet and the omnivorous diet and what they have seen is those patients who were given the vegan diet had shown some improvement but the effect uh, but but the size was very less and what is the another thing that they have seen is those who were uh, on the vegan diet they have shown that they are continued to be statistically better than those who actually were not on the vegan diet coming to the uh, other diets like caloric restriction diets and the keto diets so this is uh, mainly uh um, there was lot of uh, this thing going on uh, on whatsapps or internets like to take keto diets whether they have any influence on arthritis and other diseases so the scientific reason behind this is like when we were in when we when we were in fasting or in starvation there is one ketone body which is produced that is called beta hydroxy butyrate it was shown to inhibit uh, nlrp3 inflammasomes thus uh, it re- de- reduces the il1 beta production in urine models this was even uh, studied in uh, certain obese patients with non obese patients where the adipose tissue also had shown to reduce the expression of the nlrp3 however uh, there were no uh, good studies on these diets there was one uh, randomized study on low glycemic diet in lupus it did not show any effect on either disease activity or pain or function coming to the red meat so most of the patients uh, come to us they ask whether we have to eat meat or not so there is in general an evidence about like red uh, red meat causes lot of inflammation and it uh, like decreasing the red meat will prevent uh, mainly the atherosclerosis and associated diseases like cardiovascular disease and stroke however uh, uh, the basic uh, evi- the basic uh, uh, reason for this is um, the thought is like red meat increases the iron and nitrates and it causes the free radical production and that's how it will increase the synovial inflammation so there was one last study that is epic north folk study which has shown uh, there is moderate risk of uh, uh, increase in the rheumatoid arthritis when patients have taken uh, red meat 
However, there was another prospective study of by NHS which uh, over a larger duration that is over 22 years, it did not show any definitive risk of red meat in rheumatic diseases. Coming to the elemental diet, elemental diet uh, means just uh, it contains amino acids mainly the mono disaccharides or medium and long chain triglycerides, it doesn't have any whole proteins. So there was one study which was done in patients with RA where they have uh, given elemental diet versus oral prednisolone and they had, uh, they had seen some improvement, 20% improvement in the early morning stiffness and Ritchie articular uh, index. However, it was not studied in uh, other uh, diseases or uh, no other studies were to show that it has an effect in rheumatic diseases. Uh, coming to the diary, like uh, most of the patients, uh, they actually come and uh, they were already on the lot of uh, restriction uh, thinking that the cow milk protein was presumed to be the, uh, causing allergy and that was the reason uh, for the studies on the diary. So the data on milk and dairy products is very much controversial. So there was one study uh, that is Epic Norfolk study which has shown a positive association in patients but uh, the uh, risk was not significant. Other uh, large study was the Dova Women's Health Study which has shown that increasing the milk in the diet had actually had Im good improvement in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And another study in osteoarthritis which had sh shown that there was the reduction in the joint space narrowing when the milk consumption is increased. So taking all these into consideration, the elimination of the dairy from the diet is not really recommended. Uh, this is basically uh, considering the health benefits of the diary mainly as it includes calcium and vitamin D. When we take that into account, uh, taking that di uh, diary is uh, reasonable in patients with uh, arthritis. Coming to the vegetables and fruits, so as I've seen in the uh, initial two uh, surveys that we I mentioned, like most of the patients that have reported the uh, of the consumption of potatoes or tomatoes and some kinds of fruits, they have uh, increased in the severity of the symptoms. There were no studies, uh, no major studies on these particular fruits, but we, if we see the uh, certain murine models uh, which had sh shown that uh, these particular fruits have certain products like grapefruit had uh, a product called camphorol and other uh, citrus fruits like grapes and oranges and apples tomatoes, spinach, potatoes, these are the common foods that the patient asks whether we have to avoid or not. So these particular uh, foods have a uh, content called caumuric acid uh, and uh, other food which was pre uh, frequently asked is the eggplant. It also has a content called anthrocyanosis. These are all uh, shown to decrease the inflammatory markers mainly the IL-1 beta TNF alpha and there are also some enzymes which are involved in inhibiting enzymes involved in oxidative pathways. So when we look into this particular aspect, vegetables and fruits in a sense they are not harmful to any kind of the vegetables, however we don't have any clinical studies in this regard. Coming to the alcohol and red wine, so there are uh, very few studies which had shown that there is 30% decrease in risk of RA with moderate consumption of alcohol versus no alcohol, however the other studies have not shown such association, uh, but there were a lot of confounding factors like uh, there are many people with metabolic syndrome, smoking, there are other factors were also there. So whether to take uh, this moderate consumption as, a, uh, I mean whether to take it or not, it is still a debate. Coming to the red wine, red wine they say it is good for health because it is rich in lot of polyphenols and it reduces the inflammation and lipid metabolism and it has lot of antioxidant properties. But there were no good studies on red wine and rheumatic diseases. Coming to the high sugary drinks, so, uh, now in this era like most of them will be consuming lot of uh, junk and along with lot of uh, uh, sugary drinks like cokes and all. So this was the largest study in US uh, which had uh, shown that regular consumption of uh, excess free fructose beverages that is more than 5 times per week. They have uh, 3 times as likely to have arthritis than those who uh, co not consume or the low consumers. This was a prospective study done in a young, uh, in, a, in a group of young patients. Uh, the scientific evidence was like it, it may be because of the excess sugars will lead to increased accumulation of the glycation products and which will cause the inflammation. And uh, in this study it was shown that there was more incidence of zero positive RA when compared to the zero negative RA. So it's better to rethink when you drink, when you are going to drink. 
So coming to the coffee and tea, so there is one study which had shown that if you increase the risk, uh, there was increased risk if you take more than four cups of coffee or, and decreased risk when we take like three, like three cups of tea. However, it was not uh, uh, shown in other studies. So it was seen that like it is actually the total amount of the coffee that you take is the reason it is not the amount of the caffeine or the amount of uh, decaffeinated coffee or the tea that was uh, that you are taking and this is also like uh, uh, shown increased incidence of zero positive RA rather than zero negative RA what they have uh, there was another study which was showing that actually the solvents which are used in the processing or the extraction of the coffee they may be uh, causing this increased rheumatoid factor um, after coffee and uh, tea comes the green tea so uh, the uh, positive aspects of the green tea come for, from this particular product called EC, EGCG that is epigalactocatechin so there were no studies uh, basically this particular product is an anti-apoptotic and it has properties in decreasing the synovial fibroblast proliferation and matrix metalloproteinases that's how it has uh, antioxidant properties However, uh, there was no studies in RA. There was one study in lupus which has shown that there was improvement in those who are taking green tea versus those who are not taking. Coming to the salt, uh, salt, uh, it, was, it was shown that high intake of salt along with smoking had increased incidence. And, I mean, they have shown that there was increased person who had aqua positivity. But uh, it has to be, uh, I mean, reproduced in the larger studies. Coming to the probiotics and RA, many people will ask like whether curd, uh, whether we have to take the curd or not. So we don't have any studies on curd, but uh, like but, but there we have studies in probiotics and RA which had shown that a meta-analysis had shown that those who it has really uh, levels of the IL-6 and uh, so there is some role of uh, probiotics in RA. Vitamin D, as I've said, it is useful and the patients with those who have low vitamin D have increased risk of RA. Coming to the omega-3 fatty acids, so omega-3 fatty acids basically, alpha-linolenic acid is uh, good for us, which is uh, abundant in leafy vegetables and flaxseed and rapeseed oils. So, an omega-6 acid is not, uh, is harmful. So, there was one meta-analysis of 20 RCTs which had uh, shown that uh, taking uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids had decreased the levels of the leukotriene uh, and blood triacyl glycerols. So when you take fatty fish uh, in an adequate amount like more than 0.21 grams which was associated with decreased risk of developing RA and um, this was also uh, replicated in a prospective Danish study. So there was 50% decreased risk of uh, RA when you had taken high fat diet and rather than like medium and low consumption of RA. Um, and coming to the which uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid that you have to take, it was like, uh, like you have to take like more than 2 grams per day of the polyunsaturated fatty acids if you want to give it for any patient and you have to see in the, in your, in the particular tablet that the ratio of the omega 6 to omega 3 should be in the ratio of 4 is to 1. Coming to the antioxidants, like many people will ask us like whether we have to take any other supplements like mainly the vitamin supplements when we are uh, giving along with the other medication. However, there is no evidence even with the micronutrients and the vitamins like vitamin A and C. Coming to the flavonoids and isoflavonoids, so these are also some supplements uh, that are to be given. Uh, basically a product called Ganistin which is uh, mostly uh, a compound in these particular flavonoids which had shown to decrease the synovial inflammation. However, uh, it was not replicated in uh, studies. Coming to the spices in rheumatic disease, uh, basically the spices act by decreasing the cyclooxys, by decreasing the uh, COX activation and inhibiting the NFKB pathway. So the most uh, studied the spices is the curcumin. So there was one RCT which had studied uh, the combination of curcumin and diclofenac versus diclofenac and they had shown that there was significant improvement in the uh, DAS-28 activity, swollen joint, non tender vas. But however, the inflammatory markers were reduced only in the curcumin group and compared with the diclofenac group. And there was a recent uh, uh, poster by Dr. Shenoy et al. from uh, 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 and he had shown, he had seen whether the curcumin supplementation in those who had remission, whether they have any role. Like uh, they have actually stopped the, all the drugs in a in in a graded manner, and 
they have uh, distributed into two groups and for one group they have given uh, this curcumin and piperin preparation and other group they have not given and they have seen there was no difference between the these groups in maintaining the remission and there was one RCT in lupus on curcumin which is not effective so garlic is also studied in a single RCT and it has also shown decrease in the inflammatory markers and there was a significant decrease in the group decrease in the garlic group compared to the placebo and the other spices which were studied were the ginger, cinnamon and uh, saffron they also showed decrease in the disease activity and inflammatory markers to certain extent but there are one or two studies and mostly in rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis so, so coming in whether we have any really guidelines on this particular topic so this is uh, uh, rheumatic disease and musculoskeletal disease guidelines which was published in 2021 uh, this uh, they have uh, uh, i mean they have recommend they have recommendations uh, on these particular topics like diet exercises and uh, or all most of the common diseases that we see and what they have concluded is that, uh, there appears to be no single dietary factor which leads to meaningful improvement in rheumatic disease outcomes and there are French rheumatic uh, recommendations also which were also published in the same year which says that uh, like what you have to do is like this food and spices are not substitutes but they are adjunctives to medical management and the research studies are mainly done in rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis there are only handful of studies and which are uh, often underpowered and there is a lot of bias in these studies and there is difficulty in performing studies related to uh, diet mainly it is difficult to uh, recruit the patients into your dietary studies and uh, compliance and uh, uh, under the particular study is difficult and there are lot of dropouts and uh, anti there are no uh, such thing as an anti-inflammatory diet uh, so because it is keep on uh, uh, keep on changing like when you have a study on a particular uh, dietary supplement and that will be changing so it is not a definition, it is a continuum. So what I want to say is you eat a balanced diet and maintain a healthy weight. Healthy weight, this is what uh, all needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunita. Uh, you talk, covered the whole spectrum of uh, the food and its impact on inflammatory, um, inflammatory musculoskeletal diseases. And uh, because she has to leave, she has a flight. So we open the session uh, for her. So if there are any Q&A, please. Yes, sir. Please introduce, sir. I am Dr. Rajpreet Singh from Jalandhar. Ma'am, what about uh, dals, lentils, rajma, rice in aggravation or amelioration of rheumatic diseases? See, uh, basically, in dal, legumes, there are no much studies. But if you see in the Mediterranean diet, we have a lot of dal and legumes. So taking dal and legumes definitely doesn't have any risk uh, and if you, like, because it is a part of the Mediterranean diet and it was the most uh, studied diet. And uh, coming to the next thing that you have asked. Rice, rice. Rice, uh, like rice if you take like if you take lot of rice that is with rich in high glycemic index, it will have uh, effect on inflammation like uh, it can increase the inflammation but increase in the uh, disease activity related to rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatic disease, we don't have any evidence. So, uh, how do we put up this perspective? What you are saying is, we move with the you know effect size. So, probably our food has some effect, but it does not produce that significant where we can con put up as a conclusion. So, the word we use possible, probable, and definitive. So, food does not have the definitive effect. It may be having a possible and a probable effect. That's what the uh, studies have all indicated. So, we can't conclude, but we can we can't also discount it. It has an effect and that's what this lecture will bring about because when Sanket's lecture will come about what is the effect of the food with the probiotics and prebiotics it will again you know usher a new idea so it's a very complex now we know that rheumatoid or most of the inflammatory musculoskeletal disease is associated with dysbiosis what we know conclusively is obesity so anything that decreases your obesity makes your rheumatoid better makes your psoriatic arthritis better makes your spondyloarthritis better so at the end of the day mediterranean diet in a way just if it allows you to lose weight itself is you know has a good effect size at least too thank you dr sunita you did it very well Thank you. It's my pleasure to call Professor John Matthew from Velo, 
sir does not require any introduction. So he is going to speak on influence of geo-ethnic variations on rheumatic disease. Before you start sir, I always say that when I was in training I saw the whole South India eating rice only. The whole Japan and uh, China eats rice or probably 60% of the world population eats rice as a principal meal. And when I practice in North, the whole thought process of wheat as a better food compared to rice comes up and that's something very very diff difficult to adjust and take forward. Sir, please. Let me start by congratulating the Indore team for having an excellent conference after the Covid and uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to go through this topic and uh, I think Sunita was quite comprehensive in all the diets and all its relations with uh, uh, rheumatic diseases but what I would try to do is just give an overview of the influence of geo and ethnic variations in rheumatic disease rather than going into everything possible to be looked at. So I picked up some diseases and tried to see what its influence is on the disease. I would like to start with, uh, this is Dr. Joy Phillip after whom the, this hall is named. Um, actually when I finished my medicine MBBS from Chavanda Medical College, one thing I was very clear is, I had to try to become a human being like him and hopefully like a teacher like him. But somehow we have reached in the same speciality, I'm not sure whether I'm a human being like him or a teacher like him, but this is Dr. Joy Phillip. Uh, now coming to geoethnicity, when you say ethnicity, actually it's a biologic and social construct which could in inclu include ancestral genes, our cultural influences, our geographic influences, and our socioeconomic influences, which are shared within a population. Many of us might be familiar with uh, uh, sorry. Sorry. familiar with this diagram. Uh, just keep it in mind where you know we have divided the races into different uh, populations like mongoloid, Caucasoid, Negroid. And India, South, East, South Asia was included as a mixed race of Caucasoid and Osteroid. And uh, some part of it was uh, Mongoloid, Caucasoid, like North, Northeast, and North. So that is one aspect of our ethnicity, what we thought about. And second is, the second diagram is where you have the geoposition of where we are. So we have, between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, we have the uh, tropical regions where we, most of us live and then you have the temperate regions both to the north and the south. And coming specifically to India, again actually this is an uh, uh, article published in uh, 2019 in uh, Molecular Vision by Tenwar Atal where you know they try to simplistically say India was you know you have these Dravidian race to the south and the Indo-Aryan to the north and Tibeto Burman to the northeast and some parts of north and then you had some areas of <coughs> Austroasiatic race in between and as time passes we again realize that you know again it's not as that simple as that and so you have different we try to say does the language have an influence on the ethnicity and then it's further progressed and say that you know actually we are a mixture of all sorts of races so that's where we are in that background just trying to look at some autoimmune rheumatic diseases. Now trying to come to rheumatoid arthritis, whether rheum latitude has an influence on rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a group called the GORA group. So they looked at this, and this is an article they published in 2017. And what they clearly say is, latitude gradient influences the age of onset of rheumatoid. And this is like quite a big population, about 2,481 patients and from 126 rheumatologists in 77 cities in 41 countries. When was the first onset of symptom of rheumatoid arthritis? And uh, the mean age across the group was 44 years, but for people in our area, between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, where the onset of rheumatoid was eight years before the people in the temperate region, which was a significant association. And they also found a positive correlation between 
the age of onset of RA and the inequality adjusted human development index. So is it the poverty in these countries which causes the early onset of RA or is it that they are in the tropical region? So this is left to discussion, but definitely our people have onset of RA eight years before people in the temperate region. And uh, this is uh, from the, the data from the rheumatoid GORA group. Just to say that, you know, I highlighted uh, at five degree, we have uh, about the age of onset is around 43 years, while in the northernmost and the southernmost temperate regions, it's about 48 years in this data. Now coming for that geological aspect, a geographic aspect to uh, HLA, all of us know about the shared epitope, and if we have the shared epitope, we have a high risk of rheumatoid arthritis. So actually, I just got this table from Immunogenetics, published in 2017, and uh, many of us know like HLA DRB1, 0, 4, and its alleles predisposes to the onset of RA, or the susceptibility, it's a susceptibility risk for RA, particularly 0, 4, 0, 1. And there are some protective alleles like 0, 7 and 10. And now this is a publication which came in 2012 uh, in International Journal of Human Genetics. This is from India. They looked at different populations in India. And I just tried to look at what is the incidence of 0, 4 and 0, 7 in these populations. I just highlighted in uh, North India, if you have Yadavas, 18.5% of them have 0, 4 positivity, while uh, uh, a Malayali population has 12.7, or Irula population has 6.6. .6. This is again a South Indian population. While I looked at uh, 0, 7, which is protective, the Nadar population, again you find in South India, like almost 29% of them are 0, 7 positive, so which is protective. And uh, again, again, I have just highlighted the data from Bengali and Gujarati populations, which are different. This is a study down from South India, with population from Kerala and Tamil Nadu, and looking at the HLA DRB104 in uh, different sub-populations in, uh, in, in Kerala and Tamil Nadu and which finds there is a population Narikuravar, which is an indigenous population in Tamil Nadu and the incidence of 0, 04 is 42% 40, in uh, uh, this group of population and uh, I see a lot of Narikuravar populations but my observation is I may not be seeing as many RA as you would have expected when you have 41% of their population being 0, 04 positive rather I see more of Alcaptinuria in that population because of uh, in breeding. But from that, uh, this is a slide I got from Dr. Christina from uh, JIPMA. I borrowed it from her. This is uh, how she, uh, this is a slide which published in 2020, which shows the association of HLA genes for RA susceptibility in different populations which are different, which correlates with the prevalence of RA in that population. Now, coming from RA to going to spondyloarthritis, the next common disease which we have. Uh, one thing which is very clear, there is a north-south gradient and an east-west gradient in, in regards to the prevalence of HLA B27. And north-south gradients, just to demonstrate that, the Inuit population which lives in the Arctic, they have a prevalence of HLA B27 of 25 to 50 percent, which comes down to 10 to 16 percent for the Norwegians. And in UK, it is 9.5 percent. And in Mediterranean, it's about 2 to 6 percent. So just like the north-south gradient, there is an east-west gradient. In Southeast Asia, the Indochina, the incidence of HLA-B27 is about 12 percent. But in mainland China, it's 2 to 6 percent. Why this is important is, we all know, the prevalence of HLA-B27 in a population decides the incidence of spondyloarthritis in that population. Higher the prevalence of B27, higher the incidence and prevalence of spondyloarthritis in that population. So why this one possible is this negative selection pressured accepted by malaria? That is like B27 people in tropics probably have not survived because of malaria. We looked at this aspect in the Tamil population. So we, we had 200 patients, 100 on one side, people with primary ankylosing spondylitis and its comparison with the B27 subtypes and the other group is uh, 
bone marrow, uh, people, people for bone marrow transplantation, the donors, and we just took pure ethnic Tamil population, parents are Tamil, Tamil speaking in Tamil Nadu, and we found that 1% of the Tamil population is B27 positive. And we had further statistical discussion, so this is closer to the truth. The maximum we can go up to is about 1.5 to 2 percent. So, so our study says that the incidence is one person in Tamil Nadu, and we try to look at the subtypes: HLA B 27, 04, and 05 are the commonest, as in any other population. To find any particular symptom is more correlates with the uh, B subtype, and we found that a significant association of uveitis. That is. If you have 2705, there is a higher significant chance of having uveitis than 04. Now, coming from spondyloarthritis to Sjogren's, this is a big data Sjogren's uh, project consortium, again from all over the world. And uh, the summary of this big data, about 8,310 patients, is that Sjogren's appears seven years earlier in black or African Americans compared to white patients. And among the different populations, the female-male ratio was highest in Asian patients, which is 27 to 1, and the prevalence of sicker symptoms was lowest in Asian patients. And uh, there was higher salivary gland biopsy changes in Hispanics and whites, and lower frequency of ocular involvement in northern countries of Europe and Asia. This is, so among the different continents and population, so we had a South Asian population, which was again a population from Melor. And this is just the summary of the table. One striking thing I, which I found is like, in Europe and America, the onset of Sjogren's is at 54, and as highlighted in uh, South Asia, as in Velour, it was 43. So almost like 11 years difference between uh, northern uh, continents and uh, Asia. Now coming from RA, spondyloarthritis to osteoarthritis, this on, on your left is the chart which shows, this is from a Dutch population, they looked at the x-axis is the age in years and y-axis is the prevalence of osteoarthritis and they looked at the incidence of osteoarthritis in different population and the commonest osteoarthritis was DIP followed by knee and followed by hip and uh, it's interesting to see that after 50 year chances of osteoarthritis goes up which has been shown in different population and this is more in women than in men this also has been shown in different population and then on your right the table is the article which was published in august 2022 again from the indian popcorn group which says that knee oa was the most common form of uh, oa in india followed by hand oa and each of all our practitioners or whoever practices rheumatology in india would know that i rarely see a hip oa while if you have a clinic in uk your most of your many of your oa would be uh, hip oa but we rarely see and uh, this is uh, the summary of this, this is data which is published in 2009, which says that the mean prevalence of primary radiographic hip OA in Asia was 1.4%, Africa 2.8%, Europe 10.1% and, and and North America 72 So it's a huge difference, Asia and Africa on one side with less than 3%, while Europe and America like more than 7% so of hip OA. Now coming from OA going to lupus, our dearest disease like which we have. This is, uh, so I'll try to look at the best data we have is, I looked at this, the California Lupus Surveillance Project, the CLSP, which was published in 2020, which looked at the incidence and prevalence of lupus in different populations, about 7,750 patients, which, you know, all these people have the, uh, almost similar standards and with same healthcare setting. So in blacks, the incidence was 15.1 versus and the prevalence was uh, 241 and Asi Asians and Pacific Islanders was 4.1 incidence, Hispanics 4.2 and whites 2.8, clearly showing difference in uh, your skin color and the incidence and prevalence of lupus. And the same data had shown that the hazards ratio of having lupus nephritis was 3.7 times in Asian and Pacific Islanders, 1.7 times is non-Hispanic blacks and 1.8 in Hispanics. So again saying, clearly showing the differ racial differences. And this is uh, uh, one study which we looked at, we were trying to look at the effect of mycophenolate in inflammatory myositis and we compared it, our data which is the first uh, column with uh, from different countries. One feature which I found different is you have a uh, different 
cycles of uh, different courses for the myositis and uh, we have a monocyclic course most of our patients like 50, 51% of our patients have a monocyclic course and much less common or polycyclic or chronic course unlike what the Chinese and the uh, uh, Dutch population which had only 27% of uh, monocyclic course so we had our population had a much higher uh, incidence of mo uh, monocyclic course of lupus now coming to an MDA and the MDA5 myositis this is one we, which we uh, looked at now group of patients which we have presented as a poster here again the mean age of onset of MDA5 associated myositis 35 and 40 in our population which are the two Indian studies unlike 50 in the other western so China's Japan and French studies and one important thing I would like to show is the rapidly progressive ILD which is about 7% in our patients unlike like 63, 69 and uh, 63 and 69 percent in the Japanese and the Chinese so our MDA5 is different from them and even though our numbers are less 29 we did not have a malignancy like they, their incidence were 9 and 7 percent the French and the Chinese quickly about the anti NXP2 antibody again this we compared our population with the uh, data from Italy, Japan and China our risk of our incidence of malignancy was 28 percent and all of them in our adult dermatomyositis and we had more percentage of patients with arthritis and almost all our patients with JDM NXP2 positivity had heliotrope rash which is much more than all the western data and quickly about we published our data on anti tiffon gamma positivity and uh, our numbers are less we had only seven patients there's a polish data which had 11 patients the other two from japan and us have much more patients but compared to the polish data or even other data all our patients were women compared to other patients they have uh, more men also and our skin involvement in our population was very high compared to the polish data and uh, again here again arthritis is more and interstitial lung disease is more in our NXP2 tiffon gamma positive patients than the rest than the other data quickly going through the other disease Beshets uh, again this is a poster which we had presented last year in Iracon uh, sorry we have a person posted here so we looked at the percentage of HLA B5 B51 positivity in uh, different populations and uh, Overall, the, in the meta-analysis, the incidence of HLA B27, B51 positivity in overall population is 57%, which in Eastern Asia was 55, Middle East or North Africa was 63%, and Southern Europe was uh, 60. But for us, it was 37.2 patients. I agree, our numbers was less. We had only 43 patients, but only 43 proven Beshets fulfilling criteria, of which only 16 were B51 positive. So this is the best data we have from India. So we say that like 31, 37 patients of our patients are B551 positive. And uh, coming to the prevalence of B51 in Indian population, there is data saying, multiple data saying the prevalence could be somewhere between 6.8 to 15%. And why B551 in the context of Beshets disease? We know B5, B51 doesn't matter in diagnosis of Beshets. But why I brought this out is the pool, uh, pool's odds ratio of uh, Beshets if you have a B551 patient was 5.78 times. So because of this high odds ratio, I wanted to bring this out for the Beshets. Now coming to giant cell arthritis. Again, this is a poster we presented last year. We looked at all our charts from 2005 to 21 who had a medical report for prevalence of to find how many uh, GCS we have or polymergia we had only 10 patients so I was just looking at so maybe we were screened about 5 lakh population and we had 10 patients of polymergia rheumatic or G GCA this was very different from what in UK the incidence of PMR is like 9.59 per 1 lakh population and it's about the prevalence is about point close to 1 person like maybe like close to a like RA this was similar in Italy as well, the prevalence is much high. So obviously PMR, GCA is very different and uh, so that, that's what we have uh, seen in our observation. I'm not talking about Takayasu in short of time. All of us know Takayasu is our own disease, we Japanese and the Oriental population share. Just a couple of points more I would like to say is chikungunya arthritis is again our disease. And why I brought this out is Chronic arthritis due to chikungunya virus develops in up to 60% of individual patients. And this has been shown up in uh, this article in 2015. So 60% of chikungunya virus in that people get uh, chronic arthritis. So this is important for us. And this is the epidemiology of chikungunya as, for, as of uh, 2020. 
again it's more in the tropics and you know where it is from so we are sort of endemic for chikungunya and so we we tend to see more of chronic arthritis which could be could be zero negative or sometimes some of them may have low titer positivity of antibodies which is again you have to keep in mind again not to forget infections with rheumatological manifestations dengue zika or even co infection for that enough data saying there is co infection of zika chikungunya and dengue which is more which will be more in our population now just briefly having run through the diseases just i want to clarify one or two points actually those who are interested in uh, anthropology or sociology this is one book you can read it's called the genetics and the unsettled past the collision of dna race and history it's by somebody called keith vailu so they have did, what is race what is ethnicity are they the same i'd explained what is ethnicity before but just a point about race the amount of genetic variation within any of our races between Caucasian or uh, Negroid, whatever it is, is more than the average difference within the race. Average difference of the people within the race, so that it actually demystifies or bursts out the concept of race or caste or whatever it is. And there are no genes that are unique to any particular race. Whereas ethnicity, it's some part of it is acquired or we self-ascribe. based on factors like where we live or the culture we share with our people so these are things why i wanted to put this out is the racial categorization have resulted in vastly different socio economic realities for these people so when you have because of the racial differences you have high levels of poverty in some groups poor access to education and health greater exposure to crime and environmental injustice and other social ills so this could alter the perception or the uh, manifestation of diseases and race is used as some as or just one point race can be used by some as a motivation to discriminate to consider other people inferior so this is why i wanted to bring out that part also in this talk so uh, that's probably a summary of uh, what i would like to say thank you thank you professor john be here yeah, yes, so sir. that we can get more insight to all the questions and answers that will follow up uh i would request dr sanket sas that uh you can speak on probiotics prebiotics and other microbiome driven therapies in rheumatic disease such an interesting because whole lot of work is being done on this area is a consultant rheumatologist at ahmedabad gujarat
and no one really knows, right, what started first, is it the dysbiosis or the disease, and it is not a one point thing that dysbiosis happened, the disease started, it's a continuous process, it is going to be there till your patient is there. So we have to think it in very dynamism, that this is not a one point process, right. So the second dilemma is whatever this dysbiosis or the prebiotics, probiotics we discuss, at what stage it is all connected. Right? We divide this is done in rheumatology also as a pre, early, established and advanced. And that is something I think we humans are not capable to correlate so many organisms, so many chemicals, their interaction with the body and maybe the machine learning is one of the answer to tell that, okay, what can be done. Nomenclature is also a dilemma. Many of us might not be exactly aware what is probiotic, what is prebiotic, right? Until Unless it is a viva question. So the probiotic is a live microorganism administered in an adequate amount, one for a health benefit. That's a key line, one for a health benefit. Prebiotic is a substrate which is utilized by the <coughs> microorganism. I think this is the easiest thing, right? So the organism which is eating is your probiotic. What it is eating is your prebiotic, right? And then other therapies we have is microbiome-driven therapy. This is science and take it to a layman, but do not take it like a layman. The probiotic, prebiotic, and physics, right? I am not going much in detail that how does this probiotic and prebiotic work, but they work with more and more upregulating the regulatory pathways and reducing the inflammation at the gut. The bottom line is benefit. Prebiotic, probiotic has a purpose to benefit and that's why like we see it at a, as a therapeutic advance. Uh, I tried to look in evidence and I think my previous uh, speakers have already mentioned the evidence but I just take it with lot of salt even the salt is not that healthy. There are too many confounders here what we see in the study. The endpoints are different and they are not realistic endpoint. The disease duration, the trial duration and inconsistency result. That tells us we are not clear to at least to implement that in practice we are not clear. We are still experimenting with inadequate prior results, right? Does one size fits to all, right? You have a magic pill, but your disease, your gut, your microbiome, your behavior, your food is so dynamic that we really don't know that it is going to fit with the one VSL3 template, no conflict of interest, right? And this is, I think, the real thing. What is our expectation? The left side, what you are seeing is a capacity. We need efficacy like this, and we need safety like this, right? So with those adjuvant or maybe the therapeutic, probiotic, prebiotic, are we going to get the left side, right? Because that's important. We, at the end of the all damage, all function relates to disease activity, and molecule like this do have, right? I think I won't overshoot, yeah. Now this is, I think, one of the important slides. Do you think it makes a difference? Think like a patient, right? Does it really work? That's my first question. Do we have real proof that it works, right? Cost of therapy, it will add something. The cost benefit ratio, not to the physician, right? The pill burden, the pill burden is going to come with that. Can I sustain the diet modification forever, right? Will same probiotics, prebiotics work throughout as you do with demand? Or a separate biomarker do you have? to assess the attributable benefit with prebiotics, probiotics. So this is opening the area that, okay, this can be the research question, right? So yeah, we, are, we are used to this, right? This was the yesterday night food. We are not ready for this. So the prebiotics, probiotics and exit things that, okay, this bacilli is going to help us, but how much, how long and how, right? We do not have the real question. This is my last slide, and this was not supposed to be dilemma. The business versus science of pharmaceutics, right, or the pharmacology. It is better to lose by a margin than by the science, and I'll come to my talk with this. Thank you. Thank you, Sanket. Uh, demystifying the whole concept, and why not? Please be here. So, he made it as if uh, it's a, a poetic, and you know, and it is not based on which bacteria he wanted to specify, lactobacillus or others. 
So what do we, at the end of the day, we should have certain viewpoints that how do we move forward. So I would actually expect Professor John, Dr. Neha to give their inputs also before I think I have another view. Sir, Sir what's your view? What Sanket was speaking about the probiotics. How do you see the science moving ahead? So as uh, Sanket has said, uh, everything burn down, burns down probably to the microbiome. Uh, so, but how do we target it and uh, how do we find the pathogenic microbiome uh, will decide how we uh, manage patients. I probably may not be far off. We may think of you know, antimicrobials or microbial substitution uh, before we start treating RA, maybe 10 years down the line. Ten. So microbiome with genetics, probably that's what, how the way science is going. That, that's, that again opens up the question. We have a reactive arthritis, you have an, say, a gene there and you have an infection in the gut or the genitourinary tract and you get an arthritis. You have a gene probable and then you get a gingival in inflammation due to an infective process where, you know, the bacteria is going to add on to your problem. So there is a role of a bacteria in our system, good and bad. And uh, if I say uh, the number of bacteria that we thrive on is 10 to the power 14. So the amount of genetic materials that we have is actually finite. But the amount of genetic material that we are bombarded on a day-to-day -day basis is infinite. So this is again a problem. So there is a role because a ho we, we act as a host towards those uh, microbiome. And how do they interact? And they do interact at our, in our gut. They interact in our respiratory mucosa. They interact on our skin. So it's the whole area which is yet to be explored in a, sci in a you know, uh, conclusive science. We now have certain views that is you know, coming up and it is actually going to explode. So I do not think Hippocrates with the least amount of evidence-based medicine had a view say that everything happened in the gut and the Ayurveda says it happened in gut. I don't know from where they got the idea. But there was some idea and we are again going back into our roots to understand the gut. Dr. Neha. Sir, I agree with you. As you said previously, that uh, there could be a probable and possible role of these things. But definitely we have to be on medications, the, our DMARTs and uh, other medications. So, so that is more important and this could be just an adjunct in the treatment. So if we have our views, we have a lot of us who have their own views and I think you, your uh, you know, question and answer will actually put up more questions that we need to answer. So let us open for Q&A. So we always, so if, if this question was asked by a patient, so how I would have answered a probiotic, I would have answered in a very simple manner. We have a natural uh, thing in our day-to-day -day, day -day activities called yogurt, dahi. So that's the best probiotic, it's cheap and this is our, as per our ethnicity or our cultural aspect that we eat uh, if we are not intolerant. And if I say the prebiotic, I would say, let, take, let us take a lot of fibers on which those bacteria thrive. So that is my answer to a common or the commonest person who, he knew, who need not shell out a single penny and he will actually be a winner and will never ever lose by a margin. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, sir. I am Arnav Kadra from Ames Rishikesh. Uh, in our area, many people have this belief that eating curd worsens their uh, joint symptoms, actually. So how will that... Uh, uh, so that is exactly what I said when I, when I was trained in South India. So curd was always, or yogurt was always a part of dietary habit. And so is Udat ka dal, the black gram is a part. So when you go to North India, the, and the understanding is quite different. So that's the geo, geographical variations of our thought process also, where they have a belief and they dwell on that belief without science as on today. So Shall your I point. add on that? Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, so actually, this every uh, population, you know, they have 
some specifics we say if I take this I have worsening of symptoms so there are many people say different things so actually so we did an undergraduate project we looked at uh, about 200 patients and we identified uh, what are all the precipitants of which the patients identify as precipitants of joint symptoms and then uh, we uh, whenever possible so maybe about more than 100 of them documented the symptoms of joint swelling and stiffness uh, when they say they had the food and worsening but actually there was no correlation actually so I don't know but they might be so patients can't be lying many people can be li can't be lying the same way the same so but this is what we uh, found when we looked at it but there might be truth in it which was knowledge is not very finite but yeah so, there was a PhD work that was done by Prof. Uh, Dr. K.K. Agarwal who's no more who died in COVID it was with ICMR funding and all in Institute of Medical Science way back in 1984-85 where they, their hypothesis about certain food habit and rheumatoid and it was a negative study very basic work in terms of does our food certain food habits contribute to exacerbation of rheumatoid and one has to go back to that beautiful work that was done Professor Malvia was the uh, lead researcher to that and it was a negative study so that is one that I remember from India Thank you, sir. We don't have questions on the 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 most difficult topic. Kya khana hai? Ham kaise thik honge? Ham ye khaye? But probably we just believe in too much of evidence-based medicine, and we probably do uh, lose a lot because this is the topic on everyday basis. Every time the patient enters, uh, I, we have a standard slogan: "Nahi khane se koi fark nahi padta hai." But the belief is very very strong it's deep rooted and how do we have a scientific answer to that is a, again uh, something which is a barrier we do not know how to express the science or uh, we are not understanding actually the disease also yeah uh, maybe a lot of it depends on the perception of the physician also but one of my observations is many physicians who are vegetarian themselves when the patient asks them about advice, they tend to avoid non-vegetarian. But uh, that's probably, rather than being objective, it's probably their gut feeling about it, rather than being objective on it. That's what Dr. She had shown data saying that rheumatoid doesn't change with uh, whether you're a vegetarian or non-vegetarian. Fantastic viewpoint. Yes. Uh, the only disease where your non-veg does contribute is a gout or metabolic syndrome where you eat everything which uh, Dr. Sanket was speaking. That also contributes. You can be a vegetarian, but you go on eating gajar ka halwa, you will get gout. So there is no problem of you know uh, not understanding the science. It's very simple. You take a lot of food which has a high glycemic index or certain food habit which contributes to your metabolic disease. They worsen your disease actually. So no questions. So if there are no more questions. Then we conclude. Thanks for your presence and. Uh, Thanks to the organizers.